All right, folks, welcome back. This is part two of our video on polar coordinates uh, and polar graphs. This is going to be a three-part series. Third part, we'll do some graphing by hand. This second part, though, we're just going to explore the two most common other types, non-circular types of polar graphs, that is rose curves and dimpled circles, or circles with a hole in them. Uh, and we'll start with our rose curves. Okay, so last video we left, we were looking at r equals 2 sine theta, and we talked about why, all of the reason that that thing makes a circle. I'm going to leave that two there. That, that doesn't hurt anything. And I want to think about the next thing that we did on a, a trig graph. One of those next things we did is we attached a coefficient to our value, to our x. So what happens if we attach a coefficient to our x value right here? I'm going to make two sine two theta. Whoa, something spooky has occurred. Now, I know from experience that I'm also kind of lying to myself. I need to enlarge these bounds. So with circles, you're able to have bounds from 0 to pi and acceptably see the whole graph. But with uh, any fancier curves, you really do need to go all the way around the circle uh, to see really what's going on. Okay, so what in the world have we created? Well, it kind of looks like a flower, right? I think that's what the first people that kind of figured these out thought also, was that, hey, this looks like a flower. And so they gave this the name rose curve. Now, do a, does a rose look like this? No. Not at all. I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing. I know what roses look like, and they don't look like that. But we're going to pretend anyway, um, and we'll just go with a standard established name. So we have this flower-shaped curve. Interesting. Why do we think it has this shape? Well, it all comes down to what happens when you add a coefficient here. Remember, we had a sine graph before. What happens if you add a coefficient to a sine graph? It speeds it up. It, we, we, we talked before about how it shrinks the period. But another way to think about it is that it speeds the graph up. So, remember this. Uh, let's make this 2 sine 2t. Two and you can immediately know what's going to happen as soon as I click out of this box. This graph is going to increase in speed. It's going to double the amount of waves that you see. There they are. Twice as many waves. Okay, so now let's animate this. Let's watch this be drawn. You can see how the first wave goes. Now there's the second wave. Now there's the third wave. And now the fourth wave. So before we had one wave drew a circle. That's because we were going at exactly the speed that is needed to draw a circle. And the second wave of the sine graph, which we saw down here, just drew the same circle again. Well, guess what? Now that we've sped this up, everything gets a little weirder, doesn't it? Because as we draw, oh, God, I gotta get stop this. Oh, pause you. As we draw the first loop of sine, it's basically trying to draw a circle but it's being squished into just uh, 90 degrees worth of angle instead of 180 degrees worth of angle. So the whole, whole circle, which no longer looks like a circle, it looks like a petal of a flower, is now been squished into a smaller space. And now, instead uh, with the sine graph, when we would then go negative and just draw over the same part of the graph again, well, what's going to happen? It's going to, the angle is going to be in quadrant two, Sine is negative in quadrant 2, so the graph will actually appear in quadrant 4. Okay, now we're going to go to quadrant... Did I say sine is negative in quadrant 2? Ah, sine in general is not negative in quadrant 2. I thought that sounded wrong. Um, but sine of 2x is negative in quadrant 2 because it's been sped up. Okay, so now we're going to travel to quadrant 3 where sine of 2x is positive. Notice how the graph is again drawing along the positive radius line. There she goes. And now we're going to go to quadrant four where sine of 2x is a negative graph. And we're going to finish out this rose curve with finally drawing the quadrant two. So I think personally it's very interesting to watch these be drawn because they don't get drawn in the order you'd expect them. I would expect them to be drawn in order, you know, one, two, three, four, or something. But they're actually, it's kind of much more beautiful than that. They're drawn in this smooth curve way where you could imagine that you never pick your pencil up off the paper and you never even make your pencil make a sharp corner. It's like uh, if this was a roller coaster, this could be a roller coaster, or you could drive on this smoothly and you would uh, get the full graph, which I think, you know, the rose curves are pretty, but watching them be drawn is actually really what I think is beautiful about them. Okay, so let's pause this rose curve. Um, and you can see kind of, okay, that we get... Uh, we had 2 sine of 2t, and it's interesting, we had 2t, but we got 4 petals. Why was that? Well, because in the graph of 2 sine of t, 
we kind of already have two pedals, right? We have an up loop and a down loop, and each of those made a circle. Now in sine of 2t, it just drew the same circle twice. Very boring. Um, but now if I have 2 sine of 2t, from 0 to 2 pi, which is where we're going, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 parts of the graph that get drawn, and since they don't overlap each other, they're drawn as four separate pedals. Okay, let's explore. So what if I put three in here? What do you think we'll get? Do you think we'll get uh, six petals? Right, because it'd be twice as many parts of the graph? Let's see. Oh my gosh, we only get three petals when this happens. What in the world is going on here, right? Wait, let's explore some, some more properties. So what if I make this four theta? Will I get four petals or eight petals? Let's try it. Looks like we get eight petals. Hmm, very interesting. Okay, what about five theta? Five petals or ten petals? Looks like we get five petals. Hmm, so it seems like this is related to maybe the even and oddness of the uh, little coefficient there. The number of petals appears that when the coefficient is odd, that's the same number of petals, and when the coefficient is even, let's make it eight we get double that number of petals. We get 16 petals. You can count those if you want. Pause the video, give those a count. Why does this happen? Well, let's go back to 3t, for example. All right, you can see there are indeed more functions of the, like more waves of the graphs. So you would expect there to be six petals, but look at what happens when you play it. We'll draw one petal, two petals, three petals. We're back to zero, and at pi, it then just traces over the same graph again. So that happens whenever the coefficient is odd, it shrinks the sine graph down in such a way that the second trip around is just drawing over the same graph again. And that's why we have this weird pedal relationship um, going on. All right, uh, pause you. So uh, what can we do? Well, let's, uh, let me make this, this is too big. Let's make this back to three. I like the three. Um, what happens if I change the coefficient down here now? Just gets bigger or smaller, right? Five, one, eight. Uh, Let's put that back at two. All right, so changing the coefficient out there, still just like the circle, changes the kind of like, uh, we'll say diameter, even though this doesn't really have a diameter or a radius anymore. It changes the size of the, the whole uh, shebang. Um, changing the coefficient changes the number of petals. There's one more thing that we can change. We can change the function. What if I make this two cosine of three theta? And you can observe something really interesting. It's, it's the same graph, except... It's rotated slightly. How by, by how much is it rotated? This one looks like it's been rotated about pi over six. Um, and really, if you think about it, it's really uh, makes sense with respect to sine and cosine. Sine and cosine are just shifts of each other. So you should imagine that these graphs are just shifts of each other as well. Uh, so let's look at this cosine graph. So let's see, two cosine two theta, same deal, four petals. Two cosine four theta, eight petals. Two cosine eight theta, 16 petals. The key difference, let's go put this back on uh, 4 theta. No, there's 34 theta if you want to see it. Put this back on 4 theta, the 8 petals. The main difference, that's kind of nice looking, I like that right here, is that the cosine graphs, all of the rose curves with cosine, whether it's two uh, odd or even petals, uh, start on the x-axis. Right, So you can see how this graph starts on the x-axis, and this one matches, hits all the axis, although it won't always do that. But it will always start on the x-axis. The sine graph, on the other hand, will always start between the axes. This one ends up hitting the uh, negative y-axis for some reason. Um, why does that happen? Well, because sine starts at zero and has to grow. So the first petal starts at zero and grows out. Well, the cosine graph, so let's make this 2 cosine 3t, starts at its maximum value. You can see the cosine starting at its maximum value, which is why the petal starts at its point. I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see that. Why the petal starts on the x-axis. And then as cosine shrinks, shrink, 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 the curve goes to zero. And then as the uh, cosine value becomes negative, we draw like the other petal. We draw the third quadrant petal. And then cosine returns to positive. And then cosine returns to its minimum and hits that positive x-axis again. All right, so these are rose curves. So here's our recap of everything about those rose curves. They are always going to be centered at the pole, which is our fancy polar name for the origin, but you know, the pole. The equations are r cosine, r equals cosine of b theta, and r equals sine of b theta. 
they correspond to a period change of a normal sine or cosine graph. To find the number of petals, you can look at the B value. If B value is even, you have two times that number uh, of petals. If B is odd, you have exactly that number of petals. You really do have two B petals. I'll say star, really two B, but they're on top of each other is what's happening there, right? It's, it's not that it's odd numbers are so magical. It's just they line up in a special way that they end up on top of each other, and it only looks like you have uh, B petals. Cosine roses always start on the x-axis, while sine roses always start at the uh, zero axis and go out. The petals are always equally spaced for both. If you have a coefficient out front, that changes the size of the rose curve. So again, now these are way less important than circles. I said circles show up in calculus all the time. Um, rose curves show up in calculus some of the time. Most of the time they'll give you the equation of the curve and say, here's the curve, here's its graph, here's its equation. Do something to it, but you don't have to graph them by hand. But if you did, now you should know enough to, to, to have a basic idea of what you're looking at. So if I give you the equation R equals uh, 4 sine, let's do cosine, 4 cosine of 4t. Okay, I would, look at, I would look at this and say, okay, a couple things. Um, cosine means it's going to start on the x-axis. 4t means I'm going to have 8 petals. And the 4 out front means it's going to go uh, out to 4. Uh, so it's going to go out to 4. So if we were to try to draw this beautiful flower, this is going to be a terrible drawing, by the way. I hope you're prepared. Um, we would go out to 4. I would start on the axis and draw eight petals. So I would draw a petal like this. I don't know where the other petals would go. I guess eight petals would go evenly on the axis. I would have a petal here. This is clearly going wrong somehow. I predict that four cosine of four T would look something like that. Please watch the next video where we actually graph these by hand with a pencil instead of a, a little mouse, and you will see what these should really look like. But I think it's really nice when you're graphing these, these things by hand to have some idea of what you're expecting before you start just plotting points, as you always should, right? Don't go into a graph unless you have a plan. Okay, so that was rose curves. We're now going to talk about another family of curves um, that are not flowery at all. So I want to take you back, take you all the way back to the first video where we talked about polar circles. Uh, we know that, two co for example, 2 cosine of theta equals r will be a circle centered on the x-axis uh, with a diameter of 2. And we saw why that was true. What if, what if I add a value, or subtract, but add a value, oh there she is, add a value to the end of this equation. Right, so we've, we've explored changing the amplitude. We've explored changing the period. Why don't we explore changing the midline of our graph and see what happens? So when you do that, you get this really cool looking graph uh, that is called a, a limaçon. I'll write that out or type that out, um, which I think is French for snail uh, because it, you know, it kind of looks like a little snail's shell. Uh, but that is an interesting kind of graph. And you can also, by changing the value that you add on there, you can get some really interesting things. If we make this value a little bit bigger, there we, go. we can get something that is kind of heart-shaped. Yeah, maybe we have to make this a little bit sideways to make it really be heart-shaped. But this is something called a cardioid. It's just a special case of this uh, limason type of graph. And if we make this even bigger, maybe like a three out here, we get something that is still kind of heart-shaped, but this is sort of called a, a dimpled uh, circle or a dimpled limason. Uh, so we have the three families of graph. We'll put them all in one. We have the inner loop. We have the, oh, not that one, the cardioid. And we have the dimple. And these are three pretty cool types of graphs. Uh, you might expect now, if you're paying attention on the circles, if I make a sine graph plus one, right, so two sine theta plus one, and I turn that on, what are we going to get? We're going to get the same graph as the cosine, but oriented vertically instead of horizontally. So the sine and cosine uh, graphs are basically the same. 
if I want to make this into a, let's see if I can make a really nice cardioid. What if I make that negative? There we go. This is a graph that expresses all of your feelings about mathematics right now. Uh, so, you know, here. Oops. There. So this can express all of your feelings about mathematics. I know it's also prom season. You know, you're feeling like you want to ask someone to prom. Why not ask them with uh, r less than or equal to negative 2 sine theta plus 2? I think would be a really nice, uh, you know, gesture to give to someone that you really, really like. Um, but anyway, jokes aside, why do these graphs look this way? Why do we have an inner loop? And why, 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 why does that loop disappear with certain values and just completely start to flatten out? Why does this happen? Well, let's take a look at our other screen here and we can see maybe why. So I need to get rid of you, and I'm going to add, first we had plus one, right? Think about, before I click out of here, what's this going to do to the graph? It's going to take this graph with an amplitude of two and move it up. I also changed the period back to, to zero to two pi, so we're at the basic period again. Okay, look at this graph and see if you can see right away why this graph will have a smaller inside loop. I think it is a smaller inside loop because of what I boxed right here. You can see how when the graph goes below the axis, it's now smaller. The amount of time is less than the time when the graph is above the axis. So let's watch this be drawn. Let's just animate it here. So we first draw the large outside circle. Then we draw the small inner circle. Notice how the small inner circle corresponds with this time when the graph below the axis. And we finish the outside loop. And because it's coming from a single theta, there is just a single graph going on here. So, well, does this, does this make sense? Uh, let's see, let's change this to sine. You know, see, let's play around. Okay, so sine is actually really nice to see because you see the entire outside circle drawn. Actually, not the whole thing. Then you see the inner loop drawn, and then you see the outside circle completed as we go back to 2 pi. So that shift of just shifting the midline up by one unbalances the two circles that are drawn in the graph, and that's why you get those nice smooth inner loops. Okay, what happens if they're equal? Two sine t, I'm going to keep it on sine because we're, we're kind of used to sine graphs. Um, what if I make them equal? Well, two sine t plus two is going to have an amplitude of two and a midline of two, so it's going to touch the axis of zero at just a single point. Guess what happens, right? When we touch this axis at zero, that's what makes the heart shape. The point of the heart is where the sine graph has its only zero. And that's why we don't have an inner loop. There's no time where the radius here is negative. The radius is always positive as you, as you go around, but it spends a little less time in each of these quadrants, or its behavior is a little different because of how it's been shifted around. And hopefully you can now see maybe, what if I make this 3? That's going to move the graph so that the graph of sine here has no zeros. It's fully above the axis. Which means the graph is always positive, never zero. This is the closest point right here to the graph being at zero, but it never reaches it. And so we get that nice little dimple. You can see the dimple drawn as the curve moves around. Right, as the little sine graph kind of wiggles down towards its minimum. That's what creates the dimple. So these are kind of three families of these graphs. Uh, let's see, let me play around. What if I make this negative 2 sine t plus 3? What happens? The sine graph is reflected, you know, of the graph part, and that means that the behavior here is reversed. Um, what if I make this 4 sine t plus 3? Negative 4, even. The amplitude of the sine graph has increased. Oh, now I've unbalanced it. So you notice what happens when I increase the amplitude without increasing the midline is I created some little inner loops down here. And those inner loops are going to show up in this graph. So here's another nice little, uh, it's still kind of a heart shape, but this is, is one of those inner loop uh, Limasone type of graphs. I've been saying a word a lot, and that word is limason. Uh, this is how you spell it. 
Uh, it's that C is a little, got a little uh, doohickey down there on the bottom. I got no idea what that's for. Um, but they are a very common type of polar graph. Uh, you know, if you ignore the little C, then you're going to the Limacon, which is where you go if you really like beans and you want to dress up with all the friends that like beans. But we are not going to the Limacon. We are going to talk about Limassons instead. All right, so let's do our little recap of Limasson curves again. Uh, the general form for a limason is r equals a cosine of theta plus d and r equals a sine of theta plus d. It really is that d value that causes the, the limasonness, but we do have to actually consider the a value here when we're thinking about the three types. So the three types of limason are inner loop, heart-shaped, which is called a cardioid, and dimpled. The inner loop limason, when does that happen? Sorry, cat. When does the inner loop limason happen? That happens when a is greater than d that is the amplitude is greater than the vertical shift uh, when that happens there will still be part of the sine or cosine graph below the x-axis that creates the inner loop so that's your test when will you get a heart shape well you get a heart shape when a is exactly equal to d that is when your sine or cosine graph is shifted just enough that it touches the axis at only one point and that point becomes the point of the heart. Okay, and when you get a dimpled, well, when uh, A is less than D, when does, uh, interesting font. Uh, so when A is less than D, the amplitude is a less than the shift, then uh, you're shifted so that you don't touch zero. And that's why you never have uh, the inner loop or the heart point because uh, you're never touching zero. Similarly to uh, circles, cosine limosones are horizontally oriented sine limosones are vertically oriented and i think that's pretty much all we need to know about them um oh the the a value still uh determines the size so you put a bigger a value out there um you might have to change when you change the a value it might change the type of limosone but um it will also determine the the outermost size because it determines the uh, maximum value that r can be so, and again, uh, why is this useful? Well, if I'm asking you to graph in the next section something like, you know, r equals uh, 5 sine of uh, theta plus 6, you can be like, oh, what in the world? You can say, okay, I know that uh, it's 5 sine theta plus 6. So, thinking about the sine graph, actually, what do I need to know about this? Well, it's going to have a midline of 6 and an amplitude of 5. So it's never, the sine graph itself will never touch 0. I also know that sine limosones are hor vertically oriented. Uh, I also know the highest value is 11 and the lowest value is 1. So as we swing around, I expect a graph to go up to 11, down to 1, and probably to look something like maybe this. Uh, how would this look? And where it would touch zero, it just kind of dimples and comes up like this. So I'm expecting, and I know it's vertically oriented because it's a um, sine curve. So again, is that a perfect graph? No. If I was going to submit this for, for any kind of grade, I would definitely plot some points and check. But now I have a way to think about it. Before I plot those points, I've got a way to, to at least preempt and think about what's going to happen. I want to close today's video by having some fun and encouraging you to also play around. Uh, so let's say, let's say we have our uh, dimpled limosone like this, right? 2 cosine theta plus 3. Uh, what if I also start playing around with the coefficient? You get some pretty cool stuff, right? Remember, a coefficient created a rose curve. So we can kind of mix and match these and get something like a rose curve mixed with a limosome. You can actually, you could imagine what's going on here. You have a cosine graph that has an increased period, so you get the petals, and it's never touching zero because of the plus three, so you get this cool thing. What if I make this uh, plus two? Okay, we can get kind of a rose curve, but like a pointier one, right? Like where, where it actually is a little bit cardioid-ish. Um, what if we make plus one? Now that's cool. Right, so you can get, uh, by changing the frequency there, you can start to get increased amounts of limosone e rose curves. 
Um, uh, make that, you know, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, what if we do this? That's pretty cool. And of course, if you uh, love Desmos enough, you know that if you just type a random value in there, we're using D for that value, right? Just type a random value in there, you can just make a slider and press play, right? So I encourage you to get on Desmos, make some sliders, press play, use B here and A there. Make some sliders, press play, mess around, have fun. That's that's too that might be too much fun. Mess around with these, have some fun, really explore what polar graphs are, and then also once you kind of find something cool, maybe pause those sliders. Ooh, pause. And take a second and stop and try to figure out what's going on with those specific values, right? What, what does a negative 7.6 do to the period of a graph that's causing this to happen? What does a, a you know, 9.6 cause to the midline that's causing this to happen inside? So that's, that, that's where I'm going to leave you with this fun, uh, lovely image. Just let that kind of breathe. Um, so as always, uh, please do tune in for the next video where we'll talk about how do you actually graph these by hand. And then I'm going to go switch over to my tablet and we'll plot some points uh, pretty mechanically. So please do stick around for that video. Uh, leave some comments below if you have any questions. Don't forget to do your homework. And folks, goodbye. I'll see you next time.